G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru and you've reached part three of my Python quick tip series. In this one, we're gonna be looking at how to work with lists in Python. So in part one, we actually quickly touched on lists when we looked at classes or the type of data that we can deal with in Python. And one of these types was lists. Lists are a special type of data in Python. They're essentially a container that holds onto objects. So you can have objects within lists. You can also have lists within lists. Just see them a bit like an actual list with items on it that you're checking off. Um, that, that's probably the analogy they were going for when they made them. To build a list, um, the simplest way to do it, to define a list, is actually to create a variable and assign something in square brackets with objects separated by commas. And these become items at indexes in that list. You can have lists of lists as well. So if you do more sets of square brackets within, you're implying that the items in your list are also lists and you can go as deep as possible. You can have lists within lists within lists, etc. Um, but obviously the deeper you go, the harder it is to process your data. Um, we'll be looking at iteration later on where you can actually access items within a list. So lists uh, begin at index zero and then climb from there one integer at a time. So when you're referring to the first item in a list, it's not at index one, it's at index zero. Really important for most scripting languages. You can call on the index, uh, an item at an index by writing the name of your list and then enclosing the index you want to return in square brackets. So you can see here I'm returning the object at index three, which is the number three in my list. You, could, you can also get items at sublist indices by following those square brackets with more square brackets. And each time you do, you're diving one level deeper into that list that you find at the index you call for. So you can see I'm getting the item at index two in the sublist at index zero, in this case, which is two. We can also replace items at indices as well. So in this case, we're using a recursive statement. So we're updating a variable without setting the variable. So we're saying in this case that the index of three in my list is equal to A. And what that will do is that will update my list as a variable. So the next time we call on it, say in the print function, you can see that four is now replaced with A. You can also remove items at indices um, using the function del or delete. And in, then in brackets, the list and the index. And again, it's a recursive function, so you don't have to use the equal sign to update the variable. You can, you can also use the append function, which is really useful for when you're iterating, which we'll cover a bit later. Um, so in this case, if you append an object to a list, it essentially just adds it to the list at the same level as all the items in the list currently. Length is a function that we've looked at already, um, but just a reminder that you can count the number of items in a list using the len bracket list function. Slicing is something that's quite important for lists. You can also use it for strings, which we'll look at in the next, the next time tutorial. But if you put in square brackets and use a semicolon between two numbers, you'll take a slice of a list, so a portion of that list. The first number is the start, or the index of where you want to begin. And the second number is the end, minus one. So if you call out, say, in this case, I'm calling out index four for my end, I'm going to get everything up until index three, technically, so including index three. So it's not inclusive of the last index you call for. You can also slice um, without something behind or in front of the semicolon. In this case, that tells uh, Python that you want everything from the beginning until a certain index or everything from a certain index until the end. So in this case, you can see I've sliced my list in three different ways by omitting the start or the end object of the list. You can also replace slices in the same way that you can replace items at indices. So in this case, I'm just setting a new slice. And note that the slice doesn't have to be the same size as what you're replacing. So you can grow or shrink a list by replacing a slice with a smaller or a larger set of data. And it doesn't have to be a list, it could just be one object replacing a set of data. You can also get every nth item in a list. So you can skip over items using what's called a stride. So a stride is essentially just an additional number that you put after a slice um, that implies how many, how many items you want to jump between as you go through your, your, your slice. So in this case, I'm going from the, the first to the last index, and then I'm taking a slice of two, sorry, a stride of two. So every time I take an object, I'm skipping the next object. So obviously a stride of one would give you every object. And then from there, it's just how many you're skipping minus one. Ranges are a pretty important type of data. They're not technically a list, they're a range. So they're their own data type, but they behave very similarly to lists 
and they can be turned into lists relatively easily. In this case, I'm iterating over my range from 0 to 10 with a step of 1. Um, so we'll look at the for function in a later tutorial, but essentially here it's just returning each object in that range that we're constructing. We can also get the minimum and the maximum item from a list. In this case, you can see I'm returning them in the form of a list. So I'm actually creating a list in the print function at the end, and I'm getting the minimum of zero and the maximum of nine. You can also sort a list as well, and you can reverse the order you sort in. So you can sort backwards or forwards. In this case, you can see I've sorted in one direction and then I've added the optional statement, um, which if it's not entered is implied as false. In this case, we get the, the list in both orders. Obviously, it needs to be alphanumeric or numbers in order to be sorted successfully. Um, you can also reverse a list quite easily as well by applying the function reversed to the list. Um, but it's important to note in this case, you do need to reconstruct the, the list back into a list data type. Yeah, otherwise, it won't be, be printable or workable beyond this point. You can get the first index of an item as it occurs in your list. In this case, you can see we're looking for the first index of two, which occurs at index one. And as well as that, we can also count the number of times something occurs within a list. So in this case, I'm counting how many times the number five occurs in this list. And you can see that it's returning two occurrences. We can also, um, we, we also have to be really careful, like I was saying, of recursion in lists. So if you're updating a list, um, you have to be aware that sometimes that list will affect other callouts of that list later in the script. So if I'm defining a list here as my list, and then I say that your list equals my list, and then I append something to my list, it's actually updated your list as well, because the two variables point to the same list in this case. So you can't always just pass variables between lists and manage separate copies of the data. So you do need to be careful when you're setting these variables. Um, there's a couple of other data types we're not going to focus on in this session because they're a little bit more complicated. Um, dictionaries are very similar to lists. I don't use them myself very much, but I know some people do. So it's worth looking into them if you're interested by them. Essentially, they rely on a key value. So they can be really useful when you're using something like a like a, an architectural software where you've got a room that's number is what defines the room and all the other information can be associated to that as a key. So really important. Um, it's really important to note too that lists don't behave how you think they might when you apply arithmetic to them. So if I'm going to add a list of 1, 2, 3 and a list of 4, 5, 6, you might expect that it's going to add them in parallel. So it's going to add 1 to 4, 2 to 5 and 3 to 6. But instead what it does is it joins the lists together, which is a useful function, but it's probably not what you expected it would have done. So if we want to actually work with lists in this way, we need to use a package called NumPy or Numerical Python. And that gives us access to the array command, which essentially allows us to work with lists in parallel. And you can see here that now I can work across lists at the same indices. I'm not going to focus on this package because it's got very particular usage, um, not really applicable to how I use Python typically. But if you're interested in working this way um, with arrays, definitely check this out. So we've reached the end of lists and how you can work with them. Um, we're next just going to quickly explore strings and then we're going to delve further into functions and iteration. So thanks for watching this tutorial and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Take care.